Please give a really big welcome to Mark Oak. Thanks, Chris, and um, just thanks to Chris and Jess for inviting me up here. Yeah. Uh, um, again, it's quite cold in Melbourne, so um, it's always <laughs> love to get up to the beautiful Illawarra. And um, thanks for everyone for coming along and showing interest, because this is, um, you know, it's such an important issue, and it's, and it's great that people, people in this area are so engaged with it. Um, if you, uh, if you actually cause a problem. Um, and then you exaggerate that problem so everyone thinks it's a crisis and then you blame somebody else for it and then you offer a solution that actually won't solve the problem but you make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> You're doing really well, okay? That's a great, a great business plan. And that's exactly what the coal seam gas industry is doing at the moment in terms of what we're hearing about a lot, which is the, the gas crisis. Now, in, in New South Wales, um, I'm going to talk about that. I'm, I'm going to start actually by talking a little bit about the, giving a bit of background to just how big this thing is because you're all part of something, um, uh, you know, your experience with coal seam gas here makes you part of something that's very, very big that's happening um, all over Australia, uh, or, well, particularly Eastern Australia, but actually all over Australia. And, um, you know, we're all people from our local areas, but we're also Australians and we probably, you know, care a fair bit about um, about what's happening uh, even in, in areas that are, are a long way from us, but, but are part of this country. So, um, just to get going on that, uh, I'll just put this up here, I'll just briefly introduce the Australia Institute to those who aren't here. Can I get an idea, how many people were here last time I gave a talk, who can I just, so I know who I'm Okay, no worries, probably about half of yeah. um, So the Australia Institute's an independent research organisation based in Canberra, and we have, we've got five researchers, and um, so we're a fairly small organisation, but they're mostly economists, and we do research into a whole range of issues that we think are important in Australia for the national debate um, on across environment, um, social, economic sort of issues. And one of our main areas of interest is the impact of the mining boom or the mining expansion, including gas, on other industries in Australia. So a lot of this research is based on that. And this is just a, a bunch of recent research papers that we've done on this issue that are all available for free download on the internet. And if people want to leave their email address and stuff, I can, I can pass on all of this material if people are interested. So, the first thing, I, I just always like to go back and talk about physically what it is we're talking about in terms of gas. And I'll just start with what we, you know, what we use it for. So, so gas is a, is a hydrocarbon. So there's two types of carbon, basically, that we exploit for energy. And that's coal and, and gas. And the gas is methane. And both of those things, coal and gas, have an energy content. And if you burn them you can use that energy for different things. So there's three main areas, in, well there's three main things that we use it for all around the world, including in Australia. The first one is in buildings, and we, most of it is used in buildings for either heating the space with gas heaters, or heating water, because we use a lot of hot water, um, and a small amount of that is used for cooking. The second area, and so, and in Australia generally about a third of it is used in, in, in that area. Um, less, a bit less in New South Wales. The second one is to produce electricity. And in Australia, the, because you can use gas to, to generate electricity, in Australia that's about, um, that's about a again, about a third of gas use. In New South Wales it's much, much less. You don't have many gas power plants at this point. And the third one is in industry, and that's a bigger chunk in New South Wales, but again, it's probably about a third of Australian, Australian gas use. And that's used in a handful of industries in particular, so that the overwhelming majority of it, I think about 85% is used by the chemical industry and, and non-ferrous metals, so aluminium smelting in, in particular. So the, the huge bulk of the gas is in, is, is in those particular industries, 
but a fair bit of heat from gas is used in food processing and, and other manufacturing industries like that. And that's important because what the gas industry is trying to do is, um, is basically get turn the manufacturing industry against people like yourselves who have been objecting to um, coal seed gas. So, the, uh, in terms of gas, so there's a whole lot of, so all gas is methane. All the, all the gas we use for energy is methane, okay? So, there's, now there's a bunch of different types. So people talk about conventional gas and unconventional gas. So just a very simple explanation of that. The, the, one, the most common gas that we've exported in Australia so far is conventional gas that's in oil fields. So you generally get, it's, it's, actually, in, it's actually within rock, and um, the rock contains liquid oil and gas. And they, when they drill for the oil, they also get out the gas, and the gas can be used. There's also some oil, there's also some gas fields that don't have oil. And uh, one example, and, and there's some in the Cooper Basin. So, and th these are the two that have been exploited most because they're the easiest to get the gas out from. As you go, and, and, and they're, so they're known as conventional gas. The next easiest one probably is coal seed gas, but it's, much, it's actually harder than, um, than conventional gas. And the reason that coal seed gas is harder is that it, you need heaps and heaps of wells. So instead of having one big well offshore, you've got to have them all over the place. And that, and that makes it A, very expensive, but B, it's very intrusive on, uh, on people because you end up having massive gas fields across Australia and that becomes, um, you know, it's a huge amount of infrastructure and it's also, people don't like it, it's very, very unpopular. So, you know, that's, um, that's harder to get uh, than your conventional gas. And the third one is shale gas, which is, and, and the, the coal seam gas is in, obviously within coal seams. Shale gas is much deeper and it's in shale rock and they, they have to go deeper, so that's actually more, more difficult to get than the coal seam gas. But again, it has a lot of wells and can be on farmland and that kind of thing. Tight gas is just a, a little bit different. It's actually kind of in sandstone and that's um, a bit harder again to, to extract. So, so it's all, basically it's all methane. It's just, it's just the level of difficulty of getting it out of the ground. Um, huge areas of Australia have gas underneath them. So all of these, all of these grey areas are where there's, either, there's coal seam or shale or conventional gas. So vast areas, and a lot of it coincides with you know, really fertile agricultural land and forests in Australia. Now, um, so you know, a lot of the land looks like this, and this is just, just a photo to kind of, you know, more or less typical Australian countryside. And to get it out of the, the coal seams, um, this is the kind of infrastructure you need. So you've got your coal seams are basically in layers. Coal seams contain three things, uh, water, coal, and methane. To get it out, um, as probably most of you know, you have to pull out all the water. That takes the pressure off, and the gas can just migrate up the gas wells, and then you can take that gas away and use it. And um, you have to have a gas well every 500 to 700 metres apart. They all have to be connected by water and gas pipes and roads. And within all of that, you need to have um, compressor stations, uh, water treatment plants, um, and, uh, you know, and, and other bits and pieces of inf infrastructure. So there's that, that kind of a gas field is going to cover about, with the wells approved so far, about um, going on for 100,000 square kilometres of Queensland. That, that's actually in the US, that's a shale gas field, but it's similar kind of um, in Denver, uh, Colorado in the US. So, uh, so I can make all of this available to you if you like. That's, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's one of the gas fields that started in Queensland around Tara, so that's, um, that's already actually operating. Now when you zoom into these things, a lot of the infrastructure is huge because they have to pull out so much water. Uh, out of the ground, um, and, and it's contaminated, so it all ha actually has to be treated. So you get these um, huge ponds, and you've got to have reverse osmosis plants to to treat it, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So the infrastructure is big. Uh, it can often be pretty messy. This is in the Pilliga State Forest, and that's an unlined um, an unlined pit where contaminated water can seep back into the 
into the more superficial aquifers. And when you put pipelines in, it can also be very destructive, uh, well, you know, disruptive, I should say, and destructive. Um, you know, they often have a, a 100 metre corridor which will go through farmland or forest or whatever's in the way of the, um, of the pipeline. So, why go to all this trouble? Well, the reason is that in Australia, um, gas prices for a long, long time were fairly low, two, three, four dollars a gigajoule. A gigajoule is just the basic, um, is just the basic unit of measurement of, of gas that we use for these big quantities. Um, at the start of the, uh, at the start about ten years ago, basically. The price for gas in Asia started to get really high because they don't they don't have much, they don't have gas and they have big energy demand because of um, industrial development and it shot up to about 15, 16, 17 dollars a gigajoule. So in Australia we're about four dollars a gigajoule and suddenly in Asia it's about 16 dollars a gigajoule. So the big gas companies, the big international gas companies. Um, thought, well, if we can take this gas that we've been selling in Australia for $4 a gigajoule and get $16 a gigajoule um, overseas, we're going to make absolutely um, heaps of money. So that's what triggered the whole thing. To do that, you have to build a, an export facility because you've got to turn that gas, because you can't, you can't just export gas. When, when gas is in a pipeline, it takes up a lot of space. But when you can't um, just export that overseas because you'd need, you know, absolutely massive ships. So what they do is they liquefy it to make it take up a much smaller amount of space. So that to do that, they have to refrigerate it. So they put it through these great big, um, basically fridges, and it's actually not in this photo, but they call it LNG trains, and they send the gas through basically a great big refrigeration cycle and to turn it into a liquid store it in these big tanks and then take it out and put it on, on these big ships and they can send it all to Asia. And pretty much all of the gas that we're sending is to, is, is to Asia. And it's also interesting to know that, that these companies are overwhelmingly foreign owned oil and gas multinationals and some of them are like Exxon and uh, you know, Exxon Mobil and, and um, the French Total and companies like that and BG Group which is British. But a lot of them are big state owned companies like um, Petrogas uh, from, um, sorry, um, Petronas from Malaysia, uh, PetroChina, you know, so that they're, they're big state owned Asian multinationals as well. So that's just worth bearing in mind because if we're thinking about the national interest, we kind of got to think about who's, who's driving a lot of this stuff. Uh, so they're building, it, they're building four of these huge plants to export the gas in, on Curtis Island in Gladstone. And this, believe it or not, this is actually, there's four of these, this is actually in the World Heritage Area, um, Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. And because they have to do an enormous amount of dredging so that the ships can come in and out, uh, that's causing enormous problems too. And there's a lot of dugon deaths and um, uh, turtle deaths and, and, and dolphins and things like that, it, it, to the point where UNESCO actually sort of were threatening to take, to, um, to, well, the, the, the World Heritage status of the area was under threat. So, uh, big infrastructure again. To just Can get... I just ask a question there? Sure. Um, if seeing they're doing that in the Great Barrier Reef and it's protected from a World Heritage perspective yeah. and the world doesn't want it to happen, but it's happening, wouldn't they be able to sue them somehow for that? What I might do is just... You can go to the first question when we're finished, okay. but I might, I might um, leave that to the end because otherwise I'll uh, okay. lose my um, credit goals. Uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd lose my train of thought if I was thinking about that. Um, we're really in a, we're in a dilemma now. <laughs> okay, so this is, I'm, now I'm talking about this to just give it a bit of a sense of the scale again, because I think it's important. One of the, there's four huge projects that have been approved in Queensland. One was just approved the other day. Three of them are already under construction. The smallest one is called Gladstone, um, the Gladstone LNG project, and it's headed by Santos, who own about 25% of it, and other big gas multinationals own the rest. They're, these are their gas fields here. Now, Gladstone is up here, Brisbane is down here. 
That's about 350 square kilometres from top to bottom. That's about 200 square kilometres. Um, so uh, massive. Um, so it's a uh, so they're the companies that have the have ownership of it, which is fairly typical. Um, there's uh, there's they're, they're having a three train plant on one of those big plants on Glad on Curtis Island. They're going to have about 10,000 wells. It's going to cover 24,000 um, square kilometres. There'll be 450 compressor stations, massive water treatment facilities, uh, 20,000 kilometres of roads, and um, 6,000 kilometres of pipelines, leading to another big 435 kilometre pipeline through Gladstone. So that's just one of the big four. If you then look at all of them, that area here, this shaded area here, is all of those gas fields combined from the big four, right? So that area is, um, is you know, you can picture it here, it go from Sydney up to the border and take in a, a massive chunk of New South Wales, uh, almost as big as Victoria, probably bigger than Tasmania. <laughs> um, Australia's already the most, the four, we, because we also export some LNG from conventional gas fields, in, um, in Western Australia, and that's about that's probably about 60% of this LNG expansion that's going on at the moment. Australia is currently the fifth largest um, liquefied natural gas exporter in the world. Qatar is the biggest, and it's about 20 million tonnes a year, and this graph just represents what we export already, and that's from the Northern Territory and Western Australia. By 2020, we're going to be overtaking Qatar as the world's largest coal seam gas, uh, it's the world's largest liquefied natural gas exporter. Um, now, these are the big four that, and, and this is kind of an important point actually, these are the, this is three of the big four, these are the three projects in Queensland under construction at the moment, and another one's just been approved. Uh, approved. But the, but the, if, um, if they get more gas, here are the proposed new LNG terminals around uh, in, in Eastern Australia that can export coal seam gas. And there's a few more of them. So the point is that no matter how much gas they find, they can just expand their LNG export facilities, either on Curtis Island or elsewhere. And the plans are sitting there ready to do it. So there's not going to be gas left over for New South Wales because there won't be a surplus because they can just export it for a much higher price. The problem is, that a whole lot of um, community groups like yourselves around the country have actually stopped them in their tracks in New South Wales because people looked at what was happening in Queensland, which, had, was, which was all approved before anyone knew what was going on, and they're saying, well, we don't want to be a part of this. And, and, you, and this, this community has actually um, been a shining light in terms of the community organising to actually uh, stop or at least hold up these huge projects. The other thing that's happened is because people are suddenly aware that it's going to drive up the gas price, um, the manufacturing industry in particular uh, get, is really worried and um, we're, we're really uh, um, up in arms about that because the gas companies are already saying to the manufacturing companies, you're going to have to pay two or three times as much gas if you want your contract renewed. Right, so the manufacturers are, uh, and, and the ones that really rely on gas, because not all manufacturing does, but the ones that really rely on gas are really cross about that. So that was that's a bit of a situation for the um, for the gas companies, right, in terms of the public relations debate, and also you know the, the New South Wales government was talking about that buffer zone, which may, which I don't think it's been implemented yet, but that was potentially a problem for them as well. So the gas companies got together and thought, well, what are we going to do about this? So the first thing they did was, it, it's bearing in mind this is a problem they have created, gas prices are going up because they're exporting the gas and demanding domestic gas producers uh, pay Asian prices. So the first thing they did was whipped it up into a pack, <laughs> right? They, they said, this isn't just a problem, this is a crisis because we're not going to have any gas or any energy. So that, that was the first stage. The second stage is to blame someone else. <laughs> and that's you guys, right? So they're saying, oh, they're, they're just well, they're just ignoring the fact that the exports are what's driving up the gas prices, and um, they're pointing 
to you guys and, and people like you. And the, no worries, okay? And the, the third one is that, they, um, is that they're offering a solution that won't work because they're saying, they're saying this is, if the, the solution to it is actually to drill more gas. And as we've just seen, um, well, they're already struggling to meet their contracts to export as much gas as they're committed to and make those massive projects profitable. Well, um, even, if they, even if they do, they can just expand their export facilities. So let's just, um, just a, a couple of kind of quick facts about this um, when, that, that are kind of useful when you, when you hear it. They'll say, we need, you know, this is for energy in New South Wales. Gas, this is uh, New South Wales uh, gas demand for, sorry, this is New South Wales electricity demand. These were the projections of New South Wales electricity demand over the last bunch of years. That's what's actually happened. And the same thing has happened to gas demand. Gas demand for industrial um, mass market, which is our buildings, and for power generation are all dropping in New South Wales. Right? So they're all, the, the demand is all going down. There is no way, there is no reason for the, for the gas companies to sell gas to Australian companies for this amount of money when they can get basically that amount of money for it. So they'll, they'll demand what's called the net back price, which is the Asian price minus the cost of liquefying it and sending it overseas. So I'll have to take, are, sorry, clarification or? Yeah, what are the, all the Asians doing with this um, gas? They're doing all those things I talked about at the start, generating about. electricity, households, um, um, etc. I'll, I'll get, I will get to that again. So the second thing to note is that the entire East Coast gas field is one market. So they'll say, well, we have to, uh, New South Wales doesn't have its own gas, so we need to get our gas independence. Well, it's entirely, it's all, it's all one market. So you just, um, if, if gas doesn't come from Victoria, it can come from Queensland or New South Wales. So it, it doesn't make sense to actually divide it into individual states. It's a bit like saying, well, New South Wales doesn't produce any cars. We've got a car crisis. We import most of our things actually from overseas, but uh, in terms of around Australia, there's not import restrictions between states. Um, the, I was talking before about those the, the huge proposed projects. So currently, our, currently this is the amount of gas we, u, we use in Australia. Uh, the export facilities under construction at the moment are about double that and the amount proposed is about four times that again. So, so that's just that, that's kind of killing the idea that um, you know, if we drill more gas there will be surplus and therefore gas available for New South Wales. The other thing, the other line that you'll hear a lot is that we need gas, uh, we need a gas industry in New South Wales for jobs and for royalties for the state government to build schools and hospitals. So on the Abbey Jobs site they'll say they're creating They've created 100,000 jobs last year and they'll have a little speedometer thing ticking over about how, much, how many dollars they're supplying for schools and hospitals in the state. This is total Australian jobs, about 13 million jobs in Australia. Mining industry in total employs about 2% of the Australian workforce. The coal industry employs about less than half of 1% of the um, Australian workforce, and you can probably see there that the gas industry employs less than half of 1% of the Australian workforce. They're very, very small employers. And this is at the peak of the gas construction boom. That's going to drop by a third when they go into operation. So they don't provide many jobs. Appia, um, now of course, the gap that what they'll say is, um, what they'll say is, well, that's direct jobs, we provide all these indirect jobs. <coughs> Uh, it's true, there are indirect jobs spinning off from the gas industry, but every industry provides indirect jobs. Okay, so if every industry counted their jobs the way the gas industry did, there'd be 130 million jobs in Australia. So if you want to, if you want to understand relative jobs, just stick, to, um, just stick to direct jobs. And recently, as an example of that, um, Appia have put out a, an advertising campaign called Our Natural Advantage. And they claim in that ad that they created 100,000 jobs last year. Well, we had a look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics said that in the whole oil and gas industry in Australia, 
last year there was an additional 9,372 jobs, not 100,000 jobs. So they're using a 10 times multiplier. Uh, that's oil and gas, right? And remember, these jobs aren't necessarily new jobs anyway, because what happens is the manufacturing industry and agriculture train people up, and the gas industry doesn't train anyone, and they need very skilled labour. So what they do is they poach that labour from other industries by paying uh, wages that these other industries can't afford. So they draw people from the manufacturing and agricultural industry. So it's not necessarily, so they're not going out and offering jobs to long-term unemployed, they're taking skilled labour from other industries. The, in terms of, um, you know, you'll often hear about all the royalties they create. Uh, in Queensland, when those, all of those massive projects are going full bore, they're going to collect, they're estimated to collect $450 million a year. That will add one cent to the state's, to the state's coffers. It's a very big price to pay for um, turning Queensland into a pincushion. And finally, whenever you hear uh, the words energy security and, um, and gas in the same sentence, you should take with a very big grain of salt. There's been two major threats to energy security in Australia uh, in the last few decades. The first one was in Longford, when the Longford gas processing plant blew up and killed two people and wiped out um, Victoria's gas supply and a large part of its electricity supply for um, several weeks, right? Lights went out, nobody had heaters, nobody could cook. Um, the second one, and the second one was Varanus Island in WA, uh, that happened and a lot of their energy supply was based on gas and, that's it, and, and that knocked out their gas supply and a chunk of their electricity supply for three months and is estimated to have cost about um, two or three billion dollars to the Western Australian economy. Right? This doesn't happen with um, solar power and, uh, and wind turbines. So these are all just coming back to the, you know, the gas industry are offering a placebo for this problem, which is drilled for a whole lot more gas. So just coming back to what the actual solutions to gas shortages need to be, given that now we've got this huge export industry and there will be domestic gas shortages, the, the solutions are, are, are um, there's multiple solutions, but it's, it's in um, switching to alternatives. So, uh, hot water systems, it's actually already cheaper. So, remember in our houses we use gas for cooking, heating the space and heating hot water. It's already cheaper to run a, a uh, heat pump air conditioning unit to heat your house or cool your house, or, or and a heat pump system, they're very efficient electrical systems. It's already more efficient and cheaper to run those systems than it is a gas heater. Um, induction cooking, I don't know if any of you have used it, but it's, it's much more responsive than, than gas heating. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go, that people are going to have to go and rip out all their systems and, and buy whole new systems because you replace them as time goes on and that brings down demand overall. In terms of electricity generation, solar PV is already really close to parity. So renewable energy of all descriptions is coming, constantly coming down in cost and as gas gets more and more expensive. So there's going to be a crossover point and, um, it's, and it's already in some parts of Australia that crossover point's already been achieved. And if they go around building new gas plants, you're actually locking in gas infrastructure for the next probably 50 years, which will keep us dependent on volatile and ever-increasing gas and coal prices. Now, industry, there are some uses in industry where it's difficult to replace gas. There are a lot of alternatives. Um, there are a lot of alternatives, but they're harder to implement. But um, over time, that can certainly be done. Um, but some are more difficult than others. But remember, that's about over in Australia. That's about a third of the gas use. So that's something that can be phased out in the long term. The more we do that, the more the less dependence we have on this um, volatile and uh, and dangerous energy source. So. Um, I'm just going to just very quickly sum up. So the spin basically is that environmentalists, and they say environmentalists, they don't say um, concerned community residents, they don't say farmers, they don't say uh, manufacturers, are in danger of New South Wales gas supply, right? That's, the, that's, that's what you'll hear more and more about. Um, they offer the solution of providing more coal seam gas in New South Wales, 
and they say we need it for the jobs and royalties, and um, they and, and that we you know it's essential as an energy form. The reality is that the only reason gas prices are going up is because of the coal seam export, so the coal seam gas export port facilities. Um, no matter how much we drill, it could all be exported and it will all be subject to those Asian prices. Uh, the g gas that is a very low employer, the gas industry is a very low, low employer, and um, the you know it does contribute a substantial amount of money to state and government revenue, but that shouldn't be overstated, it should be seen in perspective. And, um, and there is an enormous energy security risk with gas that you don't get with the alternatives that are readily available now. Thanks very much.